Are you focused and determined to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of you? Are you humbly pressing on? Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts from your word so that we might indeed be changed and your name glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take a seat and turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. That's on page 1180 of the Bibles. Tonight we're pressing on with our series in this letter by looking at these verses under that heading. Pressing on. The Olympics, London 2012, is now only a few days away, a fact you probably haven't been able to escape. But one fact you may not have come across in the media is this, that the Bible holds the key to Olympic success, especially on the track. Look at verses 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straying towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In other words, for those in the race, don't look back. Instead, keep going with determination. Keep straining every muscle towards what is ahead. Keep your eyes fixed on the finish line. Press on towards the goal to win the prize. And if you've seen the film Chariots of Fire about the Christian Olympic athlete Eric Liddell, who ran for the glory of God in the 1924 Olympic Games, you'll know that the advice given to sprinter Harold Abrahams, who won the 100 meters gold medal, and somehow I intend to send those verses to Team GB this week. Just watch those medals come pouring in. And four current Christian members of Team GB are determined to press on in this way, in their different sports, as they follow Christ. They are Phillips Idowu, the triple jumper who reads his Bible every day and who <laughs> believes his success is down to his faith in God. Christine Urugu, the 400-meter runner who puts her success down to hard work and to having a Christian faith. Richard Chambers, the rower, who asked us to pray that he would honor God in sport. And Debbie Flood, another rower. Debbie apparently puts everything into her sport, training three times a day, seven days a week for 49 weeks of the year. She says it's important to aim high and train for the gold medal. But she's keen to point out it's not her ultimate priority in life. She says, being a Christian gives you a bigger perspective on life. Sport can take over your life, but for me, my faith comes first. I want to press on all the way to heaven, trusting in Christ. And it's worth it. After all, a gold medal is a crown that fades. But a crown of glory lasts forever. And the key to running the Christian race is similar to a race on the track. It is to keep your focus on the finish line, trusting in Christ. Or to put it another way, the key to living for Jesus is to keep your focus on your future in heaven. You see, these verses are really about Christian discipleship, about how we should live between being first accepted by God and finally arriving in heaven. And the picture Paul uses to describe it here is a race. Just as he does in verse 16 of chapter 2, Paul thinks of himself as a contestant in the stadium. And we are to think similarly. As contestants in the London Olympic Stadium, determined to press on to the finish line, to press on all the way to heaven, forgetting what is behind and straining every muscle towards what is ahead. So first, press on all the way to heaven, verses 12 to 16. Look first at verses 12 to 14. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on 
to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and string towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Now, to be clear, Paul's not saying he has to earn his place in heaven. He's simply using an illustration to make the point that his eyes are on the finishing line. Look at the context in verses 4 to 11. Paul has just given his testimony to warn us off trying to obtain our own righteousness or being in the right with God. Righteousness is received as a gift from God by trusting in Christ. That's verse 9. Paul then wants to know Christ better, verse 10, which means to live and witness for him, sustained by the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, and which includes suffering, because we identify with him in a world that rejects him. Paul wanted to become like him in his death, not meaning that he necessarily wanted to die a death like Jesus, although he was willing to, but meaning he wanted to live his life with the same attitude that took Jesus all the way to the cross. Paul wanted to be fully obedient to Jesus as Lord and to God's plan to save him and many others. Now, verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this. Yes, he has received righteousness, but he hasn't yet become fully obedient or perfect. In fact, he will only become so in heaven. So how should we, he, and how should we live between being first accepted by God and then finally arriving in heaven? Well, A, we are to humbly press on with confidence in Christ. It seems some in Philippi thought they'd already arrived that they'd reached the goal of Christian perfection and had become rather arrogant. Paul puts no confidence in himself, in his achievements or in his status for his salvation. Rather, he puts all his confidence in Christ. He doesn't lack assurance about his final, final salvation, yet he's never complacent or presumptuous. Faith must endure to the end. But Paul's confident that God will bring to completion the good work he has begun in those who have turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he says, verse 11, somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead, he's not doubting, but rather being humble. And this humble confidence in Christ is carried on in verse 12. Yes, he recognizes the call to Christians to aspire to the highest standards, as he states back in verse 15 of chapter 2. But Paul never claimed to have reached perfection. He knew he wouldn't this side of heaven. But he'll press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, he says. And he's very focused and determined in that. The word he uses here for press on literally means pursue. It's the same word he uses to describe his persecution of the early church back in verse 6. And that wasn't a lackadaisical pursuit. And neither is his, uh, pers his uh, pressing on to take hold of that great purpose for which Christ had taken hold of him. To bring him to full maturity in Christ in heaven. To use him to take the gospel to the Gentiles to plant churches, to grow disciples, and to turn cities upside down with the gospel. So are you focused and determined to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of you? Are you humbly pressing on? Are you pursuing it, depending on Christ? Or do you think like some in Philippi, that you've already arrived? B, we are to press on forgetting what is behind. Yes, we are to thank God for his faithfulness in the past. But Paul and we must not dwell on the past if we're to press on towards the goal. 
We're not to dwell on the past of our failures, our sins, our suffering, or even our achievements. In the 1972 Olympic Games in Munich, Lasse Viren, a young Finnish runner, was the favorite to take the 10,000 meter title. About halfway through the race, he tripped and fell over another runner. Everyone assumed he was out of the race. Against expectations, he got up and started running again. And he went on to win the gold and to break the world record. Lassie Viren is an example of what Paul is talking about here. Instead of dwelling on his mistake and his fall, he got straight back up and started running. He didn't allow anything to take his mind off the race. Last year at the Athletics World Championships in South Korea, Usain Bolt was disqualified from the 100 meter final after making a false start. It was a huge disappointment. His mom prayed for him. Afterwards he said, I was brought up in the church not to dwell on the past, but to move on. Six days later he won the 200 meter final. And then along with three fellow Jamaicans, the four by 100 meter relay gold in a world record time. And Paul, forgets what's behind. He doesn't dwell on what is lost, position, popularity, freedom, comfort. He doesn't dwell on the cost as he writes from his prison cell because it looks very small against the certainty of heaven. And nor should we. The Lord never trivializes the cost. Jesus knows from experience how real it is. But he calls us to get it into perspective. Nor does Paul dwell on his regrets. And he had more than most to regret. He had the blood of Christians on his hands. But he's a forgiven man. He knows that if God has forgiven the past, he can put it behind himself too. And so can we. As Christians were to leave our forgiven sins behind, as done with, and settled. And yet so often we can allow the past to hold us back. But when we're forgiven, it's as if God puts our sins into the bottom of a deep, deep lake. And then puts up a sign saying, no fishing. No fishing. Who needs to hear that tonight? And neither does Paul dwell on any past achievements in the service of Christ. He and we must not rest on any laurels. Rather, we must press on. And maybe other issues are tempting us to look back and hold us back. Someone emailed me the other day who has been suffering terrible pain. Their email concluded, trusting God and pressing on. Then see, we are to press on, straying towards what lies ahead, to the finish line. No doubt Bradley Wiggins has been doing just that as he's won the Tour de France. And that word straining is a very strong word in the original. It was applicable to either athletics or to chariot races in Paul's day. And it meant that every single fiber of his being was set on the goal and purpose of his Christian life. What about us? Are we following Paul's example? Paul says, I haven't arrived yet, and neither have we, and we won't be made perfect until heaven, but we're not to stand still. Rather like Paul, we're to be single-minded, in our commitment to keep going forward. So D, we are to press on being single-minded. Look again at verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I press on. Paul is single-minded in his devotion to Jesus Christ. And we should be too. Some previous Olympic gold medalists give us a picture of what that means in practice. Steve Gregrave's daily training routine for the four years up to Sydney 2000 was this, he said. 
I would get down to the rowing club for 7.30 a.m. and start with about an hour to an, to an hour and a half of endurance work on the water. The second session would be muscular, so I'd spend some time on the weights. The third session would again be endurance, either on the water or in the gym. When we were on our intensive training program, the number of sessions a day rose to four, and a couple of times a week, we'd even add a fifth. And he did that every, every day of the week, every week of the year. He's an example of single-minded determination. And we should be the same as we follow Jesus Christ in his power, reading his word and living it out prayerfully each day. And E, we are to press on being focused on heaven. Look at verse 14. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What was it that kept Steve Redgrave going? It was his goal. The prospect of winning a fifth gold medal. In the same way our goal of heaven should keep us going. In fact, we have even more incentive than Steve Redgrave. We have a sure and certain hope through faith in Jesus Christ. And a prize that doesn't fade, but is eternal. Press on towards the goal to win the prize. The goal being heaven and being like Jesus. The prize being the Lord's own well done. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award to us on that day. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. After outlining this five-part pattern, Paul writes this in verses 15 and 16. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. To be humble, confident in Christ. To be forgetful about the past. To be straining toward what lies ahead. To be single-minded and focused on heaven is the way of mature, joyful Christians. So let's live up to what we've already attained. So secondly, press on, living according to the pattern of the Bible, living according to God's word, verses 17 to 21. Look at verse 17. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. J.B. Phillips translates verse 17 as Paul saying, let my example be the standard by which you tell who the genuine Christians among you are. Before there was a New Testament, this, of course, was vital. However, as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, even today, a Christian is called to be like a letter from Christ, known and read by everybody. So we are to press on, living according to the pattern of the Bible. We're to follow the example of Paul as he follows Christ. But we're not to follow or be led astray by those in the church who live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Look at verses 18 and 19. For as often I have told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Who are those who tragically live as enemies of the cross of Christ? How can we identify them? They're those who teach salvation by works rather than by grace through faith in Christ. But because the emphasis here is on live as enemies of the cross, there are also those who, instead of accepting a self-denying way of discipleship, make their physical desires their goal, boast in what is shameful, and so set their minds on earthly things. So instead of finding in the cross both their salvation and way of life, 
they're on a path that can lead only to destruction. Whereas true Christians are not to set their minds on earthly things, but on things above. Look at verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. So let's live a life that reflects that, rather than one that indicates that this world is all there is. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. What a sure and certain hope we have in Christ. A hope that keeps us pressing on towards the goal. And a hope we need to proclaim to a world where many are without hope. You see, thirdly and finally, standing firm in the Lord does not mean standing still. Chapter 4, verse 1. And those of you on the Holy Club team this week will no doubt experience that as this week unfolds. Look at verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. We don't stand firm in the Lord by standing still, but by pressing on towards the goal, trusting, sharing, knowing, and depending on Christ and the power of his resurrection, following him and the example of Paul as he follows the example of Christ, having our minds set on heavenly things, for our citizenship is in heaven. And isn't that true for us as a church too? We won't grow or stand firm by standing still, or by resting on any laurels. We must press on in the Lord, following the pattern of the Bible, in spite of any opposition. Let's pray together. Lord, strengthen us by your Spirit to press on all the way to heaven, not wrongly looking back, but standing firm, moving forward, trusting in Christ. And we pray that individually, but also as a church too. Father, strengthen us, we pray. Help us to press on and not look back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.